Oh, right. I didn't know. Oh, it's The Rock! <laughs> he looks so good! Hi, I'm Julie Kent. I'm a ballerina and I'm a former principal dancer with American Ballet Theatre where I was their longest serving dancer in their 80 year history. I am now the artistic director of the Washington Ballet. I'm really excited to talk about dance on film today. This is Black Swan, directed by Darren Aronofsky, and we're looking at the opening scene with Natalie Portman. So that I can actually see the screen, I'm gonna wear my glasses. The original production of Swan Lake was created in Moscow in 1877, but the original Swan Lake, it started with the prince in act one. It didn't have the story about a woman being turned into a swan. It's fascinating how Tchaikovsky conceived this music specifically for a story that has been changed and morphed from the 19th century into the 20th century into the 21st century. I actually worked with Darren in pre-production in all of his research. He came and watched my performance of Swan Lake from backstage and we worked in the studios in pre-production just so he could get a talk through about all the transitions of the Odette Odile character. This choreography is created so that you can have a camera circling and that you can have just a spotlight and one person on the stage in a five feet radius. On a stage, when you're looking at an audience at the Metropolitan Opera House of 4,000 people or even a smaller venue, that wouldn't necessarily capture the attention of a huge audience. But in film, you know, we're right there. We're able to get in there and see all the detail. So the choreography is perfect for how the director conceived building this story. Darren Aronofsky, along with Benjamin Milpier, guided Natalie Portman to create a really convincing performance. But you also have to give credit to her dance double, Sarah Lane, who is now a principal dancer at American Ballet Theatre, for the lifetime of devotion and effort and dedication that she put into her craft, making this whole film at a whole other level of poignancy and excellence. In this next clip, we're looking at Mao's Last Dancer, directed by Bruce Beresford, about the life story of Li Xuanxin. We're looking at his performance in Don Quixote. I was really blown away by this performance of Don Quixote. Chi Cao, the dancer playing Li, just really beautiful technique, so clean, so powerful, elegant, really, really wonderful casting choice. Now, not every dancer in super slow-mo has the refinement of how all the positions come from fifth position, extend out into space with all the turnout and stretch of line and then resolve back into a clean fifth position. So the technique of the movement in slow-mo is revealed. We dancers don't love the slow-mo because you see all the imperfections that you don't see in real time. We prefer the live action, but it really showed what a very clean technique that Chi Cao has. The girlfriend is watching on television? Ah, there are very, very few live ballet performances transmitted into television sets around the world. So I, I'm not so sure how realistic that is. The whole story of Lee Sung Sin is so inspiring. The director focused on and cast a dancer of such caliber really speaks to not only his respect for the art form, but also of the real impact that Li had on the West. Being the first Chinese dancer taking the stage in the United States and wowing people. That impact needed to be in slow-mo. You could sort of see like the wave that it hit the people. Like that, wow, slow-mo. Like this is something I've never seen before and I will always remember it. So next up we have The Game Plan. It's a family comedy directed by Andy Fickman with choreography by Marianne Kellogg. Oh, it's The Rock! I love this! He looks so good! <laughs> I don't know what's happening, but 
but I like it. It's like Oberon. Look at him. What I really admire is the way The Rock pushed those shoulders down, he elongated his neck, he used a pommel, which is a paul en français, shoulders. So when you turn them, your body looks differently. So as dancers, we're always turning our shoulders, turning our hips, turning our head, so that we look different, we speak differently. En face is bold, to the front, to the side, écarté, a face. Right? And you could tell that he had been coached. Obviously the artistic dramatic intent was clear. He's an experienced actor, but I loved how he used that large body in a very purposeful artistic way. I love that in this film, they focus on the difficulty that even someone as powerful and strong as The Rock, as a football player, the difficulty in the detail of the muscle control. Learning how to dance is really, really hard, no matter who you are and what age you enter it. But the challenge of sort of mastering the moves and being motivated by the improvement that you make as a dancer is really huge. They really illustrate it beautifully in this film. I think it was Lynn Swan that famously also studied ballet as a professional football player because of the agility, the coordination, basically the mind-body connection, how you have to use all the fine, very small muscles, not just the big ones. I welcome any football players into the ballet studio. So next up is The Nutcracker in the Four Realms, directed by Lasse Hallstrom and Joe Johnston. In this scene, the ballerina princess, played by the beautiful Misty Copeland, explains the story of the four realms through dance. First of all, I'm a fan of anything that Missy Copeland is in because she's my friend and I've known her since she was a teenager and she's just a remarkable, wonderful, talented woman. I love to see her representing our art form in major motion pictures, so yay Misty, love you. But the production of this scene that we're looking at is clearly a film. It's a movie land. It's not what you would see as the curtain rises on any stage with the exception of the dancers, you know, the snowflakes running in or the waltz of flowers scene, or as I immediately recognize Sergei Polunin as her partner, even with all the costume and headdress and wig and no close up, the quality of his dancing was immediately recognizable. I think this film took liberties with how you use the music with the action or the drama, the choreography, but it clearly wasn't designed for a ballet audience. It's for a really large mass audience. And so I'm excited by the fact that I can go to a movie and see Sergei Polin and Misty Copeland dancing together. The next scene is from The Red Shoes, directed by Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger. It's the final culminating 15 minute dance scene choreographed by Sir Robert Heltman. That's Robert Heltman, the friend. Leonid Messine is the shoemaker. Moira Shearer is the gorgeous redhead. There she is, look at her, gorgeous. It's very Giselle-esque when the heroine comes out of the house and sort of dances around. Beautiful, it's, so, it's just so simple. The movement itself, the ballet technique, yes, it's dated, you can tell it's from the 40s, but the quality of the dancing is there. Moira Shearer was a celebrated dancer in the Sadler's Wells, which went on to become the Royal Ballet. She was a very top level professional ballerina and you can see it. Now the way she's dancing, the choreography is definitely of a different era. It's not late 20th, 21st century ballet technique, but it's still excellent. It's an iconic film. The whole ballet world is so mysterious to a lot of people. And of course, this is not a realistic portrayal of anything, but it captures the fantasy and imagination of the audience and the way the dancers, I mean, these are stars of their time. Leonid Massine, Moira Shearer, 
Sir Robert Heltman. It would be like having top stars in the ballet world now. Misty Copeland, Isabella Boylston, and James Whiteside or David Hallberg doing these roles. And so you had this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful layers of talent. And then the filmmaking and the cinematography and the costuming and the design. Iconic film. Take the time right. Next up is The Turning Point, directed by Herbert Ross. And the scene we're going to look at is when Amelia leaves the studio because she was asked to dance without emotion. Don't think. Just move as I tell you to move to the counts I give you, okay? I don't count. Then how do you know what to do when, ESP? I feel it with the music, and I make it fit. Well, don't feel it. Count it. Where were we, Peter? Oh, my. I love it. I love it. This is another epic movie for dancers. We have this really beautiful ingenue, Leslie Brown, who is in real life from this family of dancers. Isabel and Kelly Brown were both dancers in American Ballet Theater. They are four children, three out of the four of them were professional dancers in American Ballet Theater. And Isabel was my house mom, I lived with her for two or three years when I moved to New York, you know, so the whole sort of ballet family of this movie and Amelia being the next generation dancer for the family, it's sort of founded on, on truth. The director's wife, Herbert Ross's wife, Nora Kay, was a very famous ballerina and very close friends with Isabel Brown. Of course, there's a lot of fictionalization. The basis, the foundation of this movie, it's there, it's, it's truthful. This choreography is actually Alvin Ailey from The River, and I think there's also a little bit of takeoff of the Balanchine approach of doing away with the old classics, don't need the story, you just need the music and the body. It's a much more modern approach of that's all you need. I would have to say, in that time, the respect for the artist was very different than it is now. The respect of the creative space is definitely a 21st century thing. I think we're seeing all kinds of social commentary on that uh, with the Me Too movement and, and all kinds of things in all areas. It was a different creative environment at that time. We have all evolved, thankfully. But what I love is that Amelia in the end does decide to just pick up her things and leave. Exit. Stage left. I love it. In this next clip, we're looking at Billy Elliot, directed by Stephen Daltrey. And in this scene, Billy is struggling to keep up. I love this scene. It's so cute. He's got the book. Okay, Billy Elliot. Look forward beyond your fingertips. So secretly wanting to learn the positions and catch up and sort of put his body in these shapes. I mean, it's just, it's a great, great scene. The whole ballet class is learning spotting. Spotting, when you're doing consecutive turns, you keep your eye on one spot on the wall and you look at it as long as you can and then you whip your head around and find that spot again as soon as you can. Find a place on that bloody wall and focus on that spot. The teacher is extraordinary and, by the way, with the cigarette and the shouting and this sort of determination and wicked enthusiasm that she has for getting it right, brilliant performance, spot on. So one of the things that's really fantastic about this scene, though, is all the little girls in full-on tutus. That's not how ballet class goes. Maybe for your recital, your teacher might allow you to wear chiffon skirt. But this exaggeration of the ballet uniform is really effective, I think, just to show what a different world it was for Billy and how foreign and strange and how much he really had to ask himself how much he wants to do it. It's so hard for everyone, every student, whether it was Billy or any one of those girls in that room, learning the art form was so hard and you could just tell how inspired Billy was by it. I love how they captured this in this film. It's really well done. 
Now we're looking at Center Stage, directed by Sir Nicholas Heitner, starring my good friend Ethan Stiefel and myself. And we're dancing the balcony scene pas de deux from Sir Kenneth Macmillan's Romeo and Juliet. I made my debut as Juliet in 1992. My last performance on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera House in 2015. So I said goodbye to my life as a performing ballerina with this role. It means so much to me, I know. It gets me very, uh, it's very moving. It's just such a privilege and honor to have danced that role to that music with that incredible story. The clear difference when you're dancing for film is the length of the phrases. Live performance, the minute the curtain rises, you step on the stage, you're starting the arc of your character. There's no going back, there's no going forward. You're in that moment in space and time in a film. First of all, you never start shooting a film from beginning to end. You start anywhere. Sometimes you start in the final scene. Running down the balcony was one shot. Ethan's menage, which is a series of steps moving in a circle, was one shot. The kiss was one shot, done from many different angles. And so you just would chop it up in phrases. But then the magic is when they put it all together. You see all the talents of the lighting people, the cameraman, the director, the editor, the sound person. You see how all of their efforts come together. It becomes a different art form. It's film. It's no longer dance. It's dance on film. The kiss at the end of the balcony parade is part of the choreography. It is so beautiful as young dancers. We would flock to the downstage wing to watch our favorite Romeo and Juliet in that special moment. I think Nicholas Heitner clearly got the magic there. And the cuts back to the teenagers with the tears. Really, really lovely. Very well done. So in this next clip, we are looking at a different scene from Turning Point. We are actually looking at the same choreography of the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet, but it's further into the pas de deux than the clips that we saw from center stage. Oh, look for my husband. There he is. <laughs> You are seeing a performance of Romeo and Juliet as you would in the audience, but you're seeing it up close as if the audience can zoom right into the space between them. And so it is heightened by the storyline, but the performance of those two individuals, it's Romeo and Juliet and it's in the rehearsal room and it's so intimate and so beautiful and so touching. And the lines, I mean, Macmillan's choreography is just as you saw in the Setter Stage clip, it marries the story and the music and the atmosphere and the feeling just so beautifully. The sign of a great choreographer, one of them to me, is that it absorbs the interpretation of so many artists and holds up, right? Yes, it's the choreography, the ballet, but also, Leslie Brown earned an Oscar nomination for her performance in this film as a teenager. I mean, incredible performance. I think the turning point shows clearly that a great film can have great dance performances and it can have great acting performance, dramatic performances. And you see that in Leslie Brown, in Baryshnikov, in Anne Bancroft, in Shirley MacLaine. It's a great film. <laughs> Save the Last Dance, choreographed by Fatima Robinson and directed by David Petrarca and Thomas Carter. Sarah, played by Julia Stiles, is auditioning for the Juilliard School. I see about the scene is Sarah is auditioning on a stage and the judges are in the audience. Maybe if you're lucky enough to have a theater in your school that might happen, but the boyfriend in the wings is great theatrically for the film, but probably wouldn't really happen. That's okay. It works good to have that cut too. You uh, she is giving an audition on a stage with no 
point shoes, just soft ballet shoes and a chair. I think that's a dramatic film approach, but I wouldn't necessarily say that you would see that in reality. I saw a little, you know, funk or odes to hip hop, you know, saw a little break dancing, but I mean, it wasn't like, no, nah, it's not. The choreography, it was a big miss from a professional point of view in any form, not just ballet. I think if you asked a hip hop dancer, funk, jazz, any of the forms where the choreographer was inspired by, they would have a similar opinion. The next film is The White Crow, directed by Ralph Fiennes. This is a really important movie about the history of one of the greatest classical ballet dancers ever, Rudolf Nureyev, who was larger than life. Like think the Beatles, Mick Jagger, whatever sort of superstar of any field, think of that. People that took it to the next level. The fascinating thing is that my husband, Victor Barbie and I were consulted about this film in pre-production. We both shared input about our lives as dancers, but also Victor had a much more close friendship with Nureyev, sort of took him under his wing and saw him as a young dancer with a great career ahead of him. And my husband went to Russia to study at Kirov School, Vaganova School in 1969. And Victor described the apartment and how you got into it and the floors that you see. I know many of you of a certain age don't know about dance studios before Marley or Linoleum, but we used to dance just on a wood floor, just little strips of wood as you see here. And clearly this was filmed either at the Kirov, the Marinsky Theater now it's called, or a, a theater in Europe because you see all the details of the floor. The studio looks like the studio from the Paganova because I've had the pleasure of dancing there as a guest. And again, talking about the repetition, the mindset, you can see Rudy's about to go on stage and give his performance and it's just everything is just in his head, all the practice, all the repetition, the darkness, I love. They did just a marvelous realization of what it feels like backstage. Do you know what it means? Be really free. Do you? This final film is White Nights, directed by Taylor Hackford, starring the one and only Mikhail Baryshnikov. In this scene, he puts his anger struggle into his movement with choreography by another legend, Twyla Tharp. This is a great marriage of incredible choreography by one of the great American choreographers, Twyla Tharp, with one of the greatest dancers in the world, Mikhail Bershenkov. And so when you have talent of that level working together, you're going to come up with something that is mesmerizing and engrossing. Twyla clearly understood what the scene was supposed to be, shows the frustration, the anger, the desire for more, to want to leave. And Misha, being the master that he is, can pretty much make anything work. He is so gifted at nuance, sophistication, and expression. But I was also just noticing how much knee work was in here and poor Misha suffered with a lot of knee injury and I thought, oh my, that must have hurt. <laughs> but anyway, it's a great, great scene and a testament to the caliber of the people that Taylor Hackford was working with, and not to mention Gregory Hines, like one of the greatest tap dancers, gone too soon. And this is the stage of the Marinsky. There's the Tsar's box, we're looking right at it, and I had the great honor of maybe being the only American woman to dance Giselle on this stage. If I wasn't the only, I was certainly one of the few, so it's something I'm very proud of for that opportunity. So, Spasiba Bolshoi, Yuri. What I see here, beyond the extraordinary performance of Baryshnikov and the choreography of Twyla Tharp, watching it decades later, is the influence that it's had on so many other things, so many other solos and films of dance. I love when we're looking at all these incredible clips how you see they all influenced each other, starting with the red shoes and then moving on with Turning Point and White Knights and Center Stage and on and on and on. And so I think there's a lot of great 
legacy here and it'll just be really fascinating to see how it continues in the future, right? I'm Julie Kent and I had a great time exploring about 60 years of ballet on film and look forward to all that's ahead and having the opportunity to share it with you.